Well, I guess I forgot to turn on the mic again, so I don't, you probably didn't hear anything that I just prayed or said. Um, so just as, as quickly, I'm not going to pray again, but just to let you know, we're taking a pause from Revelation um, tonight to, to think about Passover, um, being we're in the Holy Week. Um, we talked about uh, the <clears throat> triumphal entry on Sunday, and then this coming Sunday we'll talk about Resurrection Day. And again, sorry, I didn't turn on the mic. You all need to come back so I can get this right. Um, be much easier. So as I was thinking about the Passover and, and what the Lord might have for us, I was really, you know, thinking about that first Passover. And in line with the things that we're faced with right now, I wonder what those Jewish people, those Hebrews, were thinking about when they were going through that time there in Egypt. You know, and as we look at the circumstances that we're involved in today, the things that are going on around us, the things that we're being told, um, some may wonder, you know, is this the end? Now, some of us may think that's a silly question, but I'm sure that question comes up for some. Um, well, I don't think this is the end, um, but I do wonder what the end will be like. You know, we're not given a clear picture of the times right before the tribulation period. Jesus told us what some of the signs would be. He told us that they would be the beginning of the things that we would see, and they would be on the increase as time went on. But just that those moments, you know, when, I don't know if those moments are months or years that we have left, but we don't really know exactly the, the things that must take place. And really, when you look at prophecy, um, there's really nothing else that has to happen for the Lord to come for us. We, we've fulfilled all the things that really have to happen. It doesn't mean there aren't other things that will happen or other prophecies that won't be fulfilled. But as far as what has to happen, I personally don't see anything else having to happen. So we're not given a clear picture of, right, of those times right before. And even those specifics that, that Jesus gave us in answer to his disciples' questions in Matthew 24, some of those are kind of obscure. And really, it still remains a mystery as to, to, to how those things will play out and, and, and to what degree they'll get before we come to that period. So tonight, we consider the Passover. And when I think about the first Passover, again, I imagine what was going through the minds of the Hebrew people. You know, especially as they watched the God of heaven bring down judgment against these lesser gods of Egypt. Some people might think this COVID-19 is a plague. Some may think it's, it's judgment. Personally, I don't believe it qualifies. But even if it did, it, it pales in comparison to the plagues that beset Egypt and the Hebrew nation. And we need to remember that in the midst of those plagues, God made provision for his people to be saved out of their circumstances. So what are the, some of the signs that Jesus taught us regard, regarding the end of days? Well, let me read from one place in Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Now those verses in particular describe what the end of the tribulation period, that seven year period that we call the tribulation. It describes what will come at the end of that. And it tells us that Jesus will gather to himself all those that have confessed him as Lord and Savior during the tribulation period. And the remaining population, it says, will mourn his coming because they're convicted because of their unbelief. Now, I don't plan to go through the tribulation. I believe that God will save confessing believers from the wrath to come, to come because his word says he will. But I wonder during these times, like we're in, how many believers wrestle with the question, when will that divine rescue happen? Well, the answer Jesus gives to that question is sometimes difficult to hear. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, he answered that question. And he says, of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. 
But Jesus does give us an interesting sign that we can hold on to if we understand it. And that's in Matthew 24, verse 37. And it says there, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of, the man, of man be. And so that, in that sign, we need to understand what he was pointing to. What he was he speaking about? What was it like in the time of Noah? Well, if you're a student of the Bible and you understand the beginnings of the book of Genesis, we have it spelled out pretty clearly for us. And there's many things I could address. But in particular, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was the picture of the earth in those days. And Jesus says, as those days were, the end of these days will be. Well, I don't think it takes a lot of imagination to see that that is coming about. We don't know to what degree that was before the flood. We don't know how much greater it was than what we're seeing today. But I can confidently say we're on our way. Because we do see the wickedness of man is great on the earth today. And we see the intent of the thoughts of his heart are really only evil, and as far as it being continual, I think we'll move to that place. I was watching television last night, and usually I stream television so I don't have to watch commercials. Last night I watched something live on TV, and, and I'm sorry I did, because I was watching the commercials. And it, it wasn't even the commercials that were stupid and insulted me as a human that got under my skin. It was those that showed the debauchery, how far we have fallen, the things that we can talk about that seem okay today, and the lifestyles that are supported. So I don't think this is such a stress, stretch to realize that we're going to get back to times like that. We also know that there were abominations in those days. It talks about the giants on the earth, and we've talked so many times about that, that, that unholy relationship between the angels that came down and human women. And there's questions about that event. Some talk about it as if maybe it was a sexual act, which a lot of people have problems with, and I don't blame them. But also, there was a lot of things thought that maybe there was a manipulation, a manipulation of the human genome, the DNA. And maybe that led to the abominations that we know as giants. We don't know for sure. And the only reason I bring that up is because today, in science, we're seeing all of those things here, possibly again, if that's what was happening before the flood. And I believe man was very sophisticated before the flood, not, not some sort of caveman that science seems to point to. And so I see us moving in the way of transhumanism and the, and the merging of technology and biology. And, and, and I believe we're moving into these days. And so there's even greater things on the horizon that we'll see that I think will play into the tribulation period. Then Jesus goes on. In Matthew 24, beginning in verse 38. And he says, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so there again, in, attached with the one I read about the days of Noah, being an indication of his, the end of times again, there's this other picture that goes hand in hand with it of people just living a life that's giving no attention to the things going on around them. It says they did this until Noah went into the ark. Well, that was over a century. That was over a hundred years that they continued to live as if nothing was wrong. You know, and I look about and I look around and I, and I think, how different are we? How different are we? How quickly life changed for us and, and we just go about as if, as if nothing really strange is happening. We may think, oh, this is strange, but we very quickly become acclimated and suddenly it's the norm and we just go with it and even some are willing to accept that this is the new norm and I say, God forbid that this would be the new norm. So it's amazing to consider that the world was destroyed with Noah and his family still in it. When you consider that he considered them righteous among all the people of the earth. Now we know from the study of the Hebrew there, when it says that they were righteous, it means that they're without blemish. Whatever had happened to the rest of humanity and their biology, this family did not have happened. 
there was a purity in them so that they could continue the race of man on the other side of the flood. But they were preserved during the destruction because God protected them. It says the ark was sealed without and within. It says that God himself shut the door that was going to protect them through the flood. And I believe that Noah and his family are a picture of the Jewish people during the seven-year tribulation period. Because a remnant of the Jewish people will be preserved through the destruction of the tribulation for the life that comes after. And in case you don't know, that's what the tribulation is about. There's, there's many believers that think that we as believers should go through the tribulation. That we should not be counted out of that wrath to come. Which is an entire contradiction to the word of God itself. Who says that he'll remove us from the wrath. But I think there's some guilt for some reason that maybe we need to be punished. We've had it too easy or something. And we can make that argument, especially as Westerners. But the fact is God says that we will not have his wrath. And so what is the tribulation period about? Why is God bringing this judgment on the world? Well, one, like we're going to see as he went against the gods of Egypt. He's going against the gods, small g, of the world. But he's also going against all of those that made the devil their father and followed after him instead of God himself, never making Jesus their savior. And also he's dealing with that final week that Daniel talks about. We won't get into that, right? But it's the final week, so seven years, a week of years, where God will do his final judgment and dealings with the Jewish people. And a remnant of those will come out of the tribulation as believers. And there will be others, I believe, that will come to faith in Jesus during that time as well. But the church will have been removed. And if that's not your belief, then I think we can still worship together. It's just we don't need to shove it down one another's throat. Because I think that happens too often in the church today. That that difference in opinion can be such a dividing point. Now, I also believe that Enoch, if you're familiar with his story, is a picture of the believing church being raptured. And thereby shielded from God's wrath. From Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 we're told about Enoch. It says Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. And so in that sense I think about it and I rewrote it. The church walked with God and they were not. For God took them. So I think that's the picture of the rapture. I think that's the picture of God coming before the tribulation period. To take us home out of the way of all that is to come. But I have to add that's also going to include a remnant. Because many that are quote-unquote in the church today, I don't believe are true believers. There's, I think there's a percentage of people that are truly converted, that have truly made Jesus their Lord and Savior. And that will be the group that the Lord comes for. And it's my prayer that every person that sits in a, in a pew or a chair in any church or says that they're a Christian truly is, and it's not a false conversion or a misunderstanding so this week, we recall Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem as both king and as the sacrificial lamb of God. He rode in on the colt of a donkey and was greeted as royalty. We talked about that on Sunday. But Jesus was betrayed before the week ended. He was tortured and murdered on a cross. All of those that greeted him that day as he rode into the city, it only took a matter of days before they turned. And they asked for a, a thief and a murderer to be released instead of Jesus. <clears throat> and then they just cried out that, that he be crucified. Now by his death on the cross and subsequent resurrection from the grave, Jesus accomplished his mission and fulfilled prophecy. He redeemed mankind and he made it possible for all people everywhere to be reconciled to their father in heaven. So tonight we consider another event that took place that week. It's an event that's celebrated every year, every year. I've already mentioned it's the Passover. And the Passover is a story of redemption. Now the word redeem means to buy out. It's a specific reference to the purchase of a slave's freedom. If a person is redeemed, then their prior condition was one of slavery. So what happens when we, by faith, enter into the redemption of the Lord? Well, we remove the chains of sin that enslaved us and instead become slaves to God. Now that word slave brings up all kinds of images, all kinds of connotations, and we don't like thinking about that. And yet if he be our master, then we be his slaves. 
And what a privilege it, would, it is to call ourselves such. Now our chains, once they're broken, they're replaced by God's grace, his mercy, his endless love. And those are the things that bind us to God. With redemption, the inevitability of death due to sin is traded for new life, life everlasting. Listen to Paul's words from Romans chapter 6, verse 22 and 3. He says, now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and in the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, when we observe the Exodus account of Passover, we see that the people of God were living in terrible, terrible conditions. It was a terrible situation there in Egypt. It began well. It began well when Joseph was still there, and it turned when they got a new Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh really forgot what the Jewish people were about and all the things that had happened with them, and he became fearful of them. Because their numbers were so great that he figured it was possible that they would rise up and then take over Egypt. And so he oppressed his people. He made them slaves and he put them through brutal work conditions. It was becoming impossible for them to live under the Egyptian rule. But we're told that God heard their bitter cries. He heard their prayers. He began the process of delivering them. He sent Moses and Aaron to, to their aid. And keep an important fact in mind as we go forward. God arranged for his people to be in Egypt. It wasn't by chance. It really wasn't even by their own decision, although their decisions were included. But God placed them in Egypt to work out a plan far beyond their understanding, far beyond their imaginations. He was working a plan for them and a plan against Egypt. Now, in God's wisdom was best to place his people in Egypt for 430 years. So I ask this question, how great is our inability to grasp the plans of God? Because I don't think they could explain what was happening for 430 years. I don't think even on this side of it, we can totally understand why 430 years was long enough or not too long that God would leave him there but it doesn't matter what we think of God's plans. They're God's plans. And what do we know about God's plans? Well, we read in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, God speaking, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God had a plan for his people and a plan for Egypt. He planned the redemption of his people and the judgment of Egypt's gods. God demonstrated mighty and awesome power in the judgments of their gods. From Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, he says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. It'll be the same in the last days, I believe. Those worshiping false gods, particularly those worshiping Antichrist, will be judged. And there were many gods in the e Egyptian pantheon, as it would have been called. Let's just mention a few of them. Because some people have gone through this story all their life, and they don't realize what was being fought against. Why did God bring these particular plagues? Was it just God's imagination? Were they just things that God thought would scare them the most? No, he brought each of these plagues against a particular god that they worshiped. Now, the plague of blood that God brought on the Nile was a clear judgment on the Nile God known as Hapi. And that God was connected with fertility, food, and water. The plague of frogs was most likely a judgment on their God, Heket. He had the head of a frog and was treated as the God of fertility. The plagues on the cattle of Egypt was a judgment on the whole cult of Apis bull. Extreme, was extremely popular in Egypt from early times. It was a cult that worshipped the bull. And it's possible that that bull worship, having been observed over all that time by the Hebrew people, led to their construction of the golden calf when they tired of waiting for Moses up on the mountain. The plague of darkness was designed to bring judgment on the god Ra. Many cultures worship the god Ra. He was the sun god who was worshipped from ancient times. 
And it's interesting that beginning with the plague of flies, the people of Israel living in the land of Goshen were exempt from the disasters. That's where it stopped coming against God's people. And concerning that, God says this, Exodus 8, 23, I will make a difference between my people and your people. That verse gives me incredible hope. Because I think God operates like that today. That he makes a difference between, he says, the difference between my people and your people. And we could take that to a higher, more general level. He says, my people, who are my people in God's eyes? Those that confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Blood-bought, children of the, of the living God. So who would they be? Well, remember all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that there was a seed that would come from the woman. That was Jesus and every, everyone who believes on him as the lineage. And then there was the seed of the serpent, which means the serpent has a seed. But God draws a line between his people and his people. And I think that's the difference. And I think he does that in our lives all the time, which is why I believe that we do succumb to some of the things that the world has, like sickness and things like that, catastrophe, tribulation. Jesus said we would. And yet I wonder just how much less we take or how much less comes upon us because we belong to him. How much better we come out of it than if we didn't belong to him. And then we see sometimes with the wicked, and we say, well, they don't suffer at all. But they suffer in a way that we might not qualify suffering when we think materially. Look how well they're doing. But are they doing well without God? Hey, I don't think so. So after that point, the children of Israel were left untouched by the pestilence. During the last plague, when all the firstborn sons of Egypt were struck down in one night, the firstborn of Israel were spared. Israel had been instructed to place upon the doorposts of their houses the blood of the lamb and to remain inside while the disaster passed them by. Now, so what was God's instruction for them during that time? Well, Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, he said, Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. So he gave instruction on what the animal was to be that they would take and sacrifice, from which they would take the blood to put on the doorpost of the home to protect them. A little bit later, same chapter, Exodus 12, verse 12, God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you in the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. You know, since the garden, it's been blood that is necessary to wash away sin. Now for some, maybe unfamiliar, would say since the garden. I mean, didn't this whole thing about the blood become later? But you go back to the story of Genesis. You go back to the fall of Adam and Eve. And you go, you go back to their decision to be disobedient, to listen to the voice of the serpent and to be obedient to his words and not to the instructions of God. And we know that when God came walking in the cool of the day and called out, Adam, where are you? That they had hidden themselves because they suddenly recognized that they were naked. God speaks to them about what happened. And then we're told something very specific without a whole lot of fanfare, that he dressed them in the skins of animals. Well, how did those skins come about? They came off of animals that had to be killed. And so blood was let, and then they were covered with the result of that, hiding their sin. And so right there in the garden, we begin to see that process of the blood being necessary for the remission of sins. We're told in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. During the celebration of the Passover meal on that night before the cross as Jesus sat there in that upper room with his disciples, Jesus identified himself with the blood. In Mark chapter 14, verse 24, he says to his disciples, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. So he spoke this truth in the process of establishing what we call the communion that we celebrate every Sunday at this church in remembrance of his sacrificial love for us. 
Now, in speaking these words, Jesus connected the blood he would shed the following day on the cross with the blood of the sacrificial lamb during the first Passover. Blood that was placed on the houses of the Hebrew people. He spoke these words as he took the third cup of four cups and then he shared it during that Passover meal. And that third cup out of the four cups during the Passover meal is known as the cup of redemption. And so how appropriate that he identifies himself in the midst of that meal, having these things being the picture of the sacrifice that he was about to make, pointing backwards to the sacrifice that was made of an actual Adam, tying all that imagery and history and purposes of God together. And as I always like to say, especially when we have the Passover Seder, which we would have had this year, is that we need to really appreciate what was happening that night of the Passover for those young Jewish men. That they had done what they were doing that night year after year since they were little kids with their parents in their own homes or maybe the home of a relative. And they would have gone through that, looking back at the times of their ancestors in Egypt, how much they suffered and the great works of God to bring them out of that bondage. But never until that night did they have their eyes opened to the one that was represented in all of those elements of that Passover meal, sitting with them. He was the bread. It was his blood in the cup. The unleavened bread there with the, with the burned scorch marks and the piercings in it was a picture of his body and what would happen to him over that coming night and the next day. It's especially important to me coming up as a Jewish man coming into a saving knowledge of Christ and it was this particular story that had such a huge part of taking me over to, to this, this side, to the truth. Because when I read this account from a messianic standpoint and had my eyes and my mind blown wide open to what it all meant all of those years celebrating that Passover Seder, having no knowledge when I was younger that it was pointing to my Savior, Jesus Christ. So that third cup, it pictures his blood. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, he says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, Jesus was sinless. And, by, and as such, he was also pictured by the unblemished lamb. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So as the lamb of God, Jesus became a ransom that would purchase our souls, rescuing us from death and the devil's grip. Now following the last plague, the children of Israel were delivered, redeemed out of Egypt. They were set free to begin their journey to the promised land. And if you know the story, which most of you do, you know that didn't go very well either. But we're not going to go there tonight. But they were free to take that journey. Now, I know, as I said at the beginning, we just began our study of the book of Revelation. And as I shared, the great majority of the book of Revelation finds its roots in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Old Testament. And as such, there are interesting parallels with the story of Passover in the book of Exodus and the book of Revelation. I won't take us through all of those, but just in, in a general sense, many of the plagues recorded in Revelation are similar to those that are in Exodus, but they're larger in scope and they're larger in effect. The message we need to receive from this review of the Passover is not to be anxious about the end times. God will always take care of his own. You may not see it like that. You may not even agree with how he does it, but you would be wrong to disagree that he is doing it. And with that knowledge, we need to be those that could lay that anxiety aside and not have everything that comes down the pike like what we're facing today be something that would derail us. That's why it's so important that we know the truth. That's why it's so important that we recognize the lie. Because we need to be able to look at times like this. And I'm not saying I haven't had my moments. I've had my moments where I've looked at this. I've had my moments of, of anger and despair. But I've had to come back to the truth. The truth is that God's got this. 
and he's got us. And whatever he decides to do with this or the next thing that comes down the pike, I need to believe that he is faithful. I need to believe that he's going to do what's right for me, for right for us. I have to believe that because it's true. You can't be anxious about the end times. You know, I've seen evidence of this over the years. I've talked about this before. Every time something would come out that might upset the apple cart about the truth of the gospel, whether it be a movie or a book, the church reacts by almost being chicken little, screaming that the sky is falling. I've seen movies come out. I'm thinking of those Tom Hanks movies. I can't even remember their names. But I remember when those movies came out, and right away, somebody put out a book. And then they put out a course of instruction. And then they put out a workbook to go with the course of instruction. Because it was a great fear that if we don't show people that this is out of line, they might believe it, speaking of the church, and follow it. Well, see, that tells me that the preparation wasn't done beforehand. That's why we're so diligent here to dig into the word. That's why I implore you to be students of the word, to learn to love the word. Because in there is the truth. And it's by that filter and that filter alone that you better recognize the lie. We shouldn't have to raise the alarm when, when, when you know, a wolf comes into the chicken home because we know it's a wolf. Because it doesn't look like the chickens. And we need to be able to react the way we're supposed to react without the stress, without the anxiety, knowing that God's in control. God will always take care of his own. Now, there's many scriptures throughout the Bible that illustrate that truth. And I could spend probably the next hour just reading you verses. And I think it's very important tonight that I, that I end with nothing but scripture. God needs to speak to you far more than I would ever need to. You need to hear God's word and let it penetrate. Now, I, before I do that, I, I had a request recently about some of these teachings maybe below the video putting a list of scriptures that I use because some people say I can't keep up with it. I can't turn the pages so fast I'm not going to be able to do that with the video itself but maybe tomorrow I will I will just email out the list of the scriptures I use tonight so I would say just do this just ask the Lord to let these words penetrate God's word doesn't return void it'll do what it's sent to do we just need to have open hearts and open ears to receive it so let me just read you several things from scripture and my prayer is, as these words go out, that you, would be, that you would be emboldened to call upon the name of the Lord for your security, for your peace of mind. That he would be the one that you would look to and cling to to break the anxiety, the nervousness, the fear that you have about this thing. From Proverbs chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. There we read, do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. You know, Proverbs is such an important book in that it speaks as a, as a father to a son. And whether it be son or daughter, we have a father in heaven who speaks through his word to us. And he says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. You can be assured of that. He says, don't be afraid of the sudden terror. You see how fast this happened? Do you see how in the last 20 years they've used terror, a word we ever, hardly ever used before 20 years ago. They've used that to capture our imaginations, to keep us in a state of fear, and always worried about our security. Since September 11, 2001, they've done their best to take our freedoms and to keep us in a continuous state of fear, always presenting to us a new boogeyman. Well, God's bigger than any boogeyman, any demon, anything the devil throws at us. And so we need to get past what man is telling us and see what God is saying. Do not be afraid of any sudden terror. No trouble that comes from the wicked one. The Lord will be your confidence. Proverbs 2, verse 7 and 8. It says, He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. So he stores up wisdom, which makes me 
feel good knowing I can go to him with whatever, whatever question I might have about whatever I might be questioning. And as long as I'm, in a, I'm upright, and what that means is, is it speaks of righteousness, and I have no righteousness of my own, none of us do, but we have the righteousness of Christ impugned to us. He's our covering, he's our righteousness. But it also speaks of a purity. When I'm in the right mind, the right state of heart, when I'm walking right with God, I know that I'm shielded by him. And that's fair. Because I've, if I'm in sin or in disobedience, then why would I expect to be covered? And yet, his grace still would go there. That's how gracious he is. But man, how much better when I'm on the right path. It says he guards the paths of justice, which tells me that injustice can have no place. Does that mean we'll never suffer injustice in this world? No. No. But God will have a plan in it. And it will go differently because he's involved. Psalm 46, verse 2 and 3. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There's some serious imagery in those two verses. And, and if, if, I, if it was mine to write, not that I'm questioning the Holy Spirit, but if it was mine to write, I, I would have maybe did the order a little bit differently. Because the first thing he lists is the earth be removed. We could stop there. There's nothing left at that point. But he breaks it down of what that removal might look like. That the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. That the waters roar and be troubled. The mountains shake and are swelling. I believe we'll see days like that. I think Jesus' words in Matthew 24 says we'll see days like that. And yet he says there that those are just the beginning. The end is not yet. And so we need to be those that are prepared to walk through those with a confidence, with an assuredness, with a peace that can only come from him. Psalm 27, beginning in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon the rock. I'm not going to break that down. I think the imagery is very clear. That he is our covering. And that he will remove us when the time is right from whatever dangers we face. And then Psalm 34 verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. What a picture. That he encamps around us. It's better than any paper mask. It's better than any biohazard suit. We have God camping all around us. And this is a lengthy read that I'll finish with, and we studied this out a couple weeks ago, Psalm 91. And I'm just going to read you the psalm, all 16 verses. So stay awake, we're almost done. But let these words penetrate your heart, and let this be what you would meditate on as we pass from this lesson tonight, and as we consider this Passover of this year. Psalm 91 it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. 
A thousand may fall at your side, but ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Our guarantees in the Lord are sure and true. We can stand upon that. And again, I'm not trying to downplay anybody's fear. I'm not trying to insult anybody that's been fearful. But I am encouraging you that there's a way through that. And there's a way out of that. And that's by putting your trust in God. And understanding that his plans are perfect. And he's going to walk us through this time. And I say it tongue in cheek, but I mean it so much that the worst thing that could happen is we end up at home with the Lord in his presence. And really, if that is something you believe in your heart of hearts, then really we should never be fearful because that would be a great outcome. And so we'll pause there for tonight. We'll pick up with, res <clears throat> with the resurrection on Sunday and then we'll return to our normal studies next week. I'll be posting an email to let you know this is up. Most of you seem to be finding it before I even do that. Again, I just wish you blessings. I miss you all. Um, haven't heard from much of you lately, but uh, feel free to send an email or a text and uh, stay in touch, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, stay blessed. Father, we just thank you for the time that we've had. We thank you for the word that you've left us, Lord, and just the pictures of all these things in the past that should give us strength today. Lord, I pray that we would be a people not governed by fear, not controlled by anxiety, not feeling trapped anywhere, Lord, because you are the one that will hide us in a safe place. And so we just give our well-being and our care over to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.